When I begin lecturing in philosophy in intro classes, I like to lead off with Plato. And someone might ask, very reasonably, why not start at the beginning? Why not start with the pre-Socratics? Why not start with Thales? Well, it's very simple. Thales and the pre-Socratics tend to be very unfamiliar to us. They are still very close to religion. They're still very close to Greek religion. They're aphoristic. We only have bits and pieces of what it is that they said. And it can be very hard to understand what's going on, to try and piece together any kind of philosophical system from that, any sort of even coherent perspective. Things are difficult insofar as they are closer to polytheism. And so that ancient Homeric worldview is one that we only with some difficulty are able to enter and splash around in the waters. So Plato is a bit of a different story, but he's not like Aristotle in the sense that Plato provides us with something that is at once familiar, interesting, engaging. You have dialogue form. So Plato writes in nothing but dialogues, although sometimes you get to, for instance, the laws are, uh, they have more monologues in them, so they have more long extended pieces, which kind of seem like treatises and the interlocutors, the people that Socrates is talking to, don't really do as much. But in general, what we have from Plato is a series of dialogues. Now, that makes it interesting. It makes it difficult to interpret in certain ways. It makes it familiar, but not too familiar. Aristotle, if we begin with Aristotle, I think we run the risk of it being a little too familiar. Aristotle writes in treatise form, and treatise form is largely the kind of thing that we get with philosophical writing today. Someone writes a philosophical essay. Someone writes a philosophical book. Oftentimes, they're going to be giving us like a speech where they're, they're talking to us. They're not talking with us. They are talking to us. And because of that, we have a situation where it's not a dialogue. It's not a philosophical conversation. And so we miss some of the richness of that philosophical conversation. Socrates will tell us that philosophy must be conversation. In fact, Socrates is going to say it must be conversation so much so that I'm not going to write anything at all. <laughs> And he didn't. So we have no writings from Socrates. All we have is writings from Plato about Socrates and then writings from a couple of other playwrights and people around that time. So we have reason to believe that Socrates probably existed. It sounds reasonable also to think that he was an itinerant teacher and questioner, someone who would stop people in the streets of Athens and, you know, talk to them at length about matters philosophical. He seems to have that kind of persona about him. And so Plato is probably not making this up, but to what extent is Plato making things up? To what extent is the work Plato's own versus what we have from Socrates? Well, that turns out to be a really hard question because Plato didn't write anything in his own voice. He only wrote through the mouthpiece of Socrates. And so we have to try and infer what in the world is going on. What of this is Plato? What of it is Socrates? Does it even give us a coherent system? In other words, does it give us a series of interlocking ideas which might form something like a theory? So we think about scientific theories, right, as being composed of different parts. And so those parts hopefully all work together without contradiction insofar as they attempt to describe something. Philosophy sort of works like that, but not always, and certainly not completely with Plato. What you're going to see is that all the pieces fit together, but there are many interpretations of each of the pieces, and there are some elements that are really hard to try and get to fit in certain ways. That's not because we have expressed contradictions. It's because what we have is an appeal to what can't be said, an appeal to experience, and specifically in every case, even where he's trying to be very syllogistic and logical, we have conversation. Conversation is necessarily a kind of back and forth between people, and we call that back and forth in Platonic studies dialectic. Dialectic refers to a conversational motion that kind of yo-yos back and forth. And I've equated this kind of thing to a dance, where you're dancing with a partner, and to be able to dance with a partner, you have to get used to where their feet are going to be, and you have to get used to you know what they expect of you, and when you're thrown to one side and then thrown to another side, and you have to kind of get a feel for that right? And you notice I'm using a lot of metaphors here. So it's like a rhythm. It's like a dance. You have to get a feel for it. It's experience and it's conversation. And that's one of the ways in which we adapt to conversation and we try and remove some of those barriers to not understanding each other in conversation so that we can hopefully then get used to that dance, participate in as a, you know, serviceable partner in that dance where we actually, in other words, look like we know how to dance um, in philosophical conversation.
And so that's part of what's going on here, and that's part of what makes Plato at once so fascinating to read and also so difficult to read because he's not just coming out and saying things. We're not going to have a glossary of bold-faced terms, or at least you shouldn't, uh, <laughs> that tell us exactly what Plato's definitions on various things are. It just doesn't work that way. So what we have instead is a series of attempts to try and get at the truth, a series of attempts to, I say get at the truth, wait a minute, we're already making some assumptions, to get at something, what are we trying to get at? That's really one of the questions in Socratic dialectic. What are we actually trying to do? And why should we suppose that we should get at the truth of something? What would that even mean? So, what we have and what Socrates insists on and what we're going to see in the different dialogues is that he will ask for you know, questions and ideas that lead to what something is. In other words, the essence of something, trying to get to what it is that makes that thing the kind of thing that it is. So what is the essence of something? It is what makes that thing the kind of thing that it is. In other words, it is the what we call a sine qua non of that thing. Sine qua non means without which not. It is an essential element that if you take that element away, it's no longer that kind of thing anymore. And you can think about this in terms of, you know, the composition of a car. You know, is it still a car if one of the wheels is missing? Probably. Is it still a car if the engine is missing? Hmm, I don't know. I mean, maybe not, right? Is it still a car if it doesn't have any seats? I mean, it's not a good car at the very least. Uh, if, it's a, if it's something that was designed, let's say, especially without any seats so that there was literally nowhere to sit down, is that really a car? It doesn't really look much like a car anymore. It's, you know, at least not something that people can drive in. And that's the kind of thing is that, so Socrates would ask then, you know, what, what makes a car? What is a car? And someone might come back and this is what we get from Mino. Someone might come back and say, oh, well, you have, you know, Mustangs and Teslas and Porsches and, you know, all kinds of other things. And Socrates might say, no, 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 you've given me a lot of examples. I don't want examples. I want to know what the unifying element is of each of those things. I want to know what makes that thing what it is. And this is not the way that we naturally think about a lot of this stuff. So, one of the principal questions in trying to understand this era in philosophy, and indeed trying to understand the origins of philosophy in general, how did this happen? Why is it that 2,400 years ago, somebody woke up and said, you know what, I want to inquire into the essence of things. <laughs> I want to try to figure out what stuff actually is. And now, if you hear some of these questions, you might start to think, oh, well, that's moving towards science. It's moving towards a modern perspective on the world that seeks to understand. Yeah. Yeah. To some extent, that's true. Now, to what extent that's true and how it is that it's different, we would have to go into a great deal of detail with respect to traditional societies, how traditional societies approach things, and what kind of science they had. And here I'm thinking particularly of Levi-Strauss, Claude Levi-Strauss's Science of the Concrete, which is chapter one of The Savage Mind, a book that he wrote in the 20th century, middle of the 20th century. La Pensée Sauvage, so the wild pansy or the savage mind. Um, different ways of translating the same thing. So, Levi-Strauss maintains that they're actually doing the same thing. They're still doing a science. They're still, you know, equipped with the, the same mental abilities that we have, because that was a question in anthropology at the time. And so, we might look at Plato's situation and say, well, it's not just that they're enlightened and waking up to now we're going to be able to do, you know, inquiry, and we've never done inquiry before. Well, that's not really the case that we've never done inquiry before. They did inquiry, and they did cataloging, and they did trying to understand the effects of things and cause and effect relationships, and there's a lot going on in primitive magic and the ways of thinking about the way that plants interacted and, you know, what stones did. And I mean, some of it might just be entirely mistaken, but nevertheless, they were trying to understand what was going on. And so insofar as they had dynamics and classes and that sort of thing, they were clearly doing Doing something that was recognizable as inquiry, and we might even say is recognizable as science, which is what Levi-Strauss did. But Plato seems to be doing something a little different. By the time we get to Plato and Socrates, we're inquiring into the essence of things. We're trying to get to the truth, the abstract truth of what makes a thing what it is. So, I might want to know what an acorn is, not for this particular acorn, but what an acorn is for all what an acorn is for all acorns. What is the essence of that thing that makes it the kind of thing that it is? 
that is a very different question because the essence of something, what makes the thing what it is, well, that's not contained in and it's not destroyable by destroying an individual instance of that thing. In other words, the idea is eternal. So what makes a thing what it is, that idea can't die. And that seems kind of weird. It's like, okay, so what? You know, that's the case. But this is important. This is important for the ancient system. This is important for the ancient world. Because the emphasis for the ancient world, when we were still dealing with cyclical time, and this is the, again, we have to go to anthropology to understand some of this trans- transition. So we move from cyclical time to linear time. Linear time is what we're accustomed to dealing with, where you have heroes and figures and individuals, and individuals matter, individual events in history matter, and the cycles of things. Yes, there are cycles and regularity, but what really matters are the geniuses, the heroes, and the individuals of history, the kings and queens and that sort of thing. For the ancient world, for the Homeric world, for the polytheistic world, that wasn't the case. What really mattered was what repeated. What really mattered was the eternal. And so Plato, by emphasizing the eternal, by emphasizing the eternal eidos, the idea, the eternal forms and the eternal ideas, he was trying to get at the archetypal. He was trying to get at the things that don't change about the world and the things that don't change about acorns and horses and tables and justice and beauty and the good and evil and all of these sorts of things. And you'll notice if you're familiar with Plato, I mentioned a couple of things there that aren't going to fit into the system. And so those are going to come up, beauty and evil in particular. Evil is not a form. Evil is a lack, but we'll get to that. Beauty as well is interestingly absent in a certain way. Beauty is the vehicle that carries us up the, uh, up the ladder with the forms, across the divided line, however you want to say it. So we'll, we'll get to that. Now, before we do that, a little bit about Socrates. So let's take a step back and consider Socrates as a person for a moment. Socrates was a very enigmatic and interesting individual in that we hear that he was himself, professedly, not very attractive. So we hear that he was snub-nosed, he probably walked kind of like a duck, and while he was interested in beautiful, beautiful, uh, the beautiful things, beautiful people and whatnot... He was more average. He was not painted as a hero. So he is not the sort that you're going to see in the, you know, paradigmatic uh, representations of male bodies that we get in ancient Greek statuary. So that in itself is kind of is kind of interesting. And so he immediately becomes a very human character. And indeed, this is one of the things that we get with Socrates that is really strange and curious, is that he insists upon the human character of his knowledge. This is in the Apology. So the the word apology simply means defense. So this was the trial of Socrates before the people of Athens, where he was ultimately put to death and made to drink hemlock for, you know, uh, impieties and uh, corrupting the youth of Athens, that this sort of thing. The apology was the trial. So he says in there that I don't have a superhuman wisdom, I have a very human wisdom. And that in itself is kind of interesting. And to understand this, we need to understand what it was that Socrates was doing and how he thought of himself and related to ancient Greek religion of the time. So he was brought up on charges of impiety, right? But it's not clear, and he says as much, that that doesn't make any sense. I'm very involved in Greek religion. I do a lot of the rites and rituals and, you know, uh, appease the gods and, and pour oblations and these sorts of things. And he was, in certain ways, a virtuous citizen as well as being a philosopher in the sense that he wasn't just saying no to absolutely everything and going and living, you know, naked inside of an urn on the streets of Athens, which is what we hear from Diogenes, <laughs> the cynic. Um, Socrates wasn't like this, although they do have a lot in common. That said, there's a story that goes along with this, and the story is of the oracle. And so what we have here is Chariphon, who was a friend of Socrates, and Socrates tells us that Chariphon went to the oracle, and the oracle was, uh, gave him a prophecy uh, for Socrates. So the oracle was, and we're thinking here of Apollo's oracle at Delphi in particular. So Apollo's oracle oracle was staffed by the Pythia. The Pythia were female uh, priests, so priestesses of Apollo, who gave these kind of oracular, mysterious uh, 
um, readings of things. So you would go there and take a pilgrimage to Delphi, ask them these questions, involve yourself in the rituals, and they would give you these pronouncements. And the oracle said of Socrates that Socrates was the wisest man. Well, now that's kind of interesting, that Socrates should be the wisest man. Chaerephon told Socrates of this, and Socrates said, no, I can't possibly be the wisest man. I know nothing. That is a key point. Socrates will say, and he's famous for saying this kind of thing, the only true knowledge is knowing that you know nothing. Well, okay, first of all, that's an interesting paradox. But secondly, it's a very strange thing for someone to say if, in fact, they are the wisest person. So Socrates then said, okay, well, that can't be right. I'm going to set about proving the oracle wrong. And this is the backstory behind a lot of what it was that he was ostensibly doing in Athens, is that he was trying to prove the oracle wrong. (laughs) Okay, so in trying to prove the oracle wrong, another thing that we should say about the oracle and oracular prophecy is that this sort of thing was very common. And in fact, it was common and very long lived around this time. So the temple at Delphi was open for some 1800 years. It's hard for us to imagine something living for that long, especially across boundaries of civilizations rising and falling. And so that it should have had that sort of staying power. First of all, this is characteristic of mystery religions. It's characteristic of religions that are not really institutional, but are secretive and somewhat underground for them to survive uh, beyond national boundaries, beyond the boundaries of states, the rise and fall of civilizations, and that sort of thing. And so we see this kind of thing in in modern times with uh, Freemasonry, and we saw it in ancient times in the same way, where the mysteries were not just a common person sort of, let's go out and have ecstatic trances and dances. This was something that the higher-ups in Greek and Roman society all the way through, including emperors, were involved in. And so it was a big deal, and it's the same kind of thing that we hear now, right, where the Freemasons had a great deal of influence in whatever way on American society. And so secret mystery-type religions, that's something that there's a very long tradition for. And so Socrates was appealing to this as a kind of deep-seated part of ancient Greek rite and ritual. Now, something should also be said about the sort of trances that one enters into and the way that the Pythia performed these rituals. This happened via something called enthusiasmos. So, this is the divine possession. And so, entering into a trance, the idea is that your individuality is set aside and the god enters. And so, it is no longer the priestess speaking, it is Apollo speaking. And this was understood quite literally. This is not just, well, well, it's kind of like this. No, no, no. This is, you know, your individuality is set aside, which is always temporary. And it's something that is, you know, in and out all the time. So the ancient Greek gods were in and out of your being and in and out of your personality and yourself all the time. So that in itself is interesting and hard for us to relate to. But at the same time, if you are in Theos, literally with a God within you, then you are enthusiasmos. So you have, you're enthusiastic. This is the word that we get enthusiastic from. So I think that's kind of interesting in itself that we've retained that. Uh, The word awesome has a similar sort of word history. Uh, So now we say that I'm enthusiastic about something, but it doesn't mean that I'm literally possessed by a God in the same way that if something is awesome, (laughs) then it's not necessarily inspiring divine awe. Uh, so that's that's kind of curious in a certain way. But anyway, so Socrates sets about trying to prove the oracle wrong. And his method for trying to prove the oracle wrong is saying, okay, well, I'm going to go and show that I know nothing to all of these other people. So I'm going to find people who should be experts on things, and I'm going to talk to them. And they'll show me, you know, what's really going on and show that I don't really know anything. Well, of course, it doesn't really work out that way. What actually happens in each of these cases is that the people are shown to be fools. They're shown that they don't really understand what they thought they knew, and they can't seem to get to the essence of these things, even though they thought that they probably could. So, one example of this is in a dialogue called the Law Case. And in the Law Case, you have two famous Athenian generals, Nicias and Laches, that Socrates encounters on the streets of Athens. And the idea is that, okay, this is a dialogue about courage, Andrea. So this is the masculine, uh, literally masculine, um, virtue of courage. And if anyone knows about courage, 
surely it's going to be these two famous generals. So that's the setup for the story. Now, this also tells us that, okay, we're in a dramatic setting, and Socrates just happened to run into these two really famous generals at the same time in the streets of Athens and engage them in the conversation about courage. Really? Um, probably not. You know, this is probably where Plato is exercising a certain amount of license with respect to the way that he's writing about these things. It seems unlikely even given who those historic personages were. So Nicias and Laches were both strategos, so they were both uh, generals. And they were at different times, and it's just, ah, you know, were they ever there at the same time, able to talk to Socrates in the marketplace? Probably not. But Nevertheless, so that's part of how it is that scholars look at this and say, okay, well, this probably didn't really happen. It wasn't just the case that, you know, Plato was sitting there writing things down feverishly, trying to remember this dialogue. Um, it's more likely that some of it was, you know, afterwards or the product of other conversations and that sort of thing. And that wouldn't have been a problem, necessarily. That would not have been a problem for this tradition. Uh, what was important was the truth, the exercise of philosophical conversation, and what it was that they were actually doing during that time. That's what matters. You know, whether it dramatically actually happened as a historical event would not have been nearly as important to them. So, that's part of the setup there. And then, in these dialogues, what happens is that Socrates goes through the process of, this is called Socratic dialectic, and this process proceeds in a number of repeatable and you know fairly predictable steps. And this is the kind of thing that we get even with the ostensibly wild um, exceptions to this that you would expect, for instance, in the symposium. So the symposium is not happening in the streets of Athens. The symposium is a drinking party. And they get together and they talk about the nature of love at a drinking party. And I think many people can probably relate to this. And so they get together and do this. And what happens is you proceed from the most superficial and commonplace conceptions of the idea and then get progressively deeper and deeper into it and presumably closer to Socrates and Plato themselves and hopefully also closer to the essence, closer to truth and knowledge. Now, that's interesting because what this means is Plato is giving us a kind of implicit ranking of different ideas and saying that, okay, well, the commonplace stuff, that's where we're going to begin, but we're also going to dispense with that very quickly. And so in the Mino, this is where you get you know, a handful of commonplace uh, attempts at trying to characterize things, and you also get different examples of what virtue is. And he's, no, 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 let's let's quickly, you know, kind of collapse this down, narrow our focus, and really, you know, get to the heart of the matter with what it is that we want to do. And so that's what happens there, and then they go further and further. It's especially interesting, though, with a dialogue like the symposium, because the symposium, you get this rank ordering, and they go deeper and deeper, but by the time you get to the very end, you have someone coming in, stumbling drunk, and then they say all of these things, and it's it's this bizarre sort of, you know, is this really you know, a deeper level? Is this closer to the truth of what's going on with love? What, how are we to understand that dramatic setting in a philosophy of an understanding of, of love? And then finally, at the very end, we have Socrates speaking and saying, you know, through the voice of Diotima that he had heard these things and been schooled on this, and so he's passing on what he heard from Diotima. That, again, just one layer of interesting dramatic, um, you know, kind of foil or cover after another, and we sort of have to peel all this back and try and understand what's going on, which is characteristically very difficult. And one of the things that makes this difficult is the element of Socratic irony. And so Socratic irony is where Socrates will say something. He'll say, oh, yes, you know, I hear that you're an expert and I don't really know anything about courage. And so I was hoping that you as the expert could tell us what we should be thinking about courage. And so Nicias and Laches are like, well, yes, of course, of course I know courage. And I would be more than happy to help you to understand this obviously important topic, you know. But the question is, I mean, you know, Socrates has been doing this for a long time. He lived into his 70s, and he was constantly questioning and talking to people. And when you encounter the same kind of thing and a thousand times in a row, nobody's ever really able to get to truth. Do you really think that you're going to get there the next time? <laughs> In other words, is he being genuine in saying, you know, oh, you're the expert, you're going to school me on this? Really? Or does he instead have the expectation that, well, okay, I'm going to show you that you don't really know what you're talking about? And there's something philosophically interesting going on in you as the expert not knowing what you're talking about. Because the idea is very much that if Nicias and Laches 
don't know what courage is, if these two famous generals, it is part of their charge, it is part of their job to try and instill courage and foster courage among their men. I mean, that's one of the things of generalship. If they can't do it and they don't know who it, uh, don't know what it is, then maybe no one does. And that's the idea, I think, in a lot of cases in the Socratic Dialogues, is that these people are paradigmatic examples of those who should know these things. If they don't know, maybe no one knows. And that in itself would be very interesting. And that might imply that there's something other than just conceptual knowledge and these formulations and definitions. Maybe that's not really what Socrates is after. In other words, maybe Socratic irony goes all the way down to his purported goals. In other words, maybe his goal of trying to get to the essence of something is itself an element of Socratic irony. So we also hear in Socrates' time, and this is something that came up in the Apology and something that comes up consistently, is that religion was losing its grip and that people were starting to stray from, and it was getting harder and harder to have any kind of real, good, tight social homogeneity with respect to religious practice. And this is something I think that we hear today as well, and that it's not the case that every age has always had this problem. I mean, that's the way that people like to start their essays, right? But that's not true. That's not really the way that things have been. It's that during this time, and this is called the Axial Age, so the birth of philosophy happens in the Axial Age in the first millennium BC, where we have, you know, Confucius, Lao Tzu, the Buddha, and then people like Thales and Heraclitus, Socrates and Plato and the others in ancient Greece. So there was something transformational happening in the world at this time, where consciousness was shifting away from the old polytheistic modes and ways of doing things and towards something like monotheism. We get the first indications of this in Egypt, of course, with the Akhenaten, and then also with um, uh, the Hebrew people coming out of Egypt as slaves and then taking some form of monotheism, whether it was from the Egyptians or not, whether we believe Freud or not, um, doesn't matter. But there was something transformational happening. There was something different. People were clamoring for something different, and it was happening uniformly across the civilized world in uh, Eurasia, essentially, and uh, in North Africa. And so, that in itself, I think, is, is kind of interesting. And so that religion is losing its grip, and part of what Socrates is trying to do, and we get this in the Republic as well, that Socrates is trying to reform religion and trying to keep the good parts and keep the gods. He do, he's not an atheist. He's trying to keep the gods, but only the good parts, like getting rid of some of the slanderous stories. And this is something that's not unique to Plato. We hear this in the pre-Socratics as well, that they want to get rid of the slanderous stories, get rid of the stuff that doesn't seem as holy, that doesn't seem as appropriate for their vision of what things should be. What should be is understood in terms of what a good person is, what the good in general is, and then what the nature of the divine is. And this is what we get in dealing with Mino, with the virtue, with virtue in Euthyphro, with the con uh, conception of the holy, and then in the Republic, with the conception of justice. In all cases, we are concerned with essentially religious topics and topics of how should we live, what is a good person, what is virtue. And so these are not just the way that we think about it in terms of scientific inquiry. So one of the things that's salient and missing from the modern university system is a concern with the psychological health and well-being of the individual. When people come into, and I, I like saying this especially in my intro to religion classes, when people come into a university, the thought is, okay, great, now I can study anything. You know, I can go and find a department of whatever, where whatever is what I want to study and, and devote myself to. But that's not universally the case. There are things that are missing. I mean, when do you take a class on how to be a good person? You know, when do you take a class on improving your mental health? I'm not talking about the study of mental health. You can do that in psychology, right? And you can go on and do it in psychiatry. You can do it in social work. There are lots of places that you can do it. I'm talking about your mental health, you living better as an individual right here, right now. What is your perspective on the world and what should it be? And often in the West, we have the tendency to say, oh, well, that's outside of the university. You know, go talk to your therapist or your priest. You know, in other words, there's something about that that we have attempted to divorce from science and that we have attempted to divorce from academic studies and from knowledge. This was decisively not the way that it was in ancient Greece. And we see this very clearly in Socrates' contention, uh, contention 
and thus Plato's contention, that virtue is the same as knowledge and is the same as the good. And so the idea there is that knowledge then is actually good for you. Knowledge is something that actually helps you. It makes you a better person. And so when Socrates was talking about the expurgation of ignorance and wanting to cast out ignorance and make people you know, more knowledgeable and better, he was literally talking about making them better, making them better people. <laughs> and so this is just not the way that we typically approach things. I don't take an organic chemistry class thinking, well, this is going to make me a better person. <laughs> I mean, maybe some people approach that in terms of like, you know, trial by fire, but that's not the way that we approach academic subjects. We tend to try and separate those areas in our lives. And that separation is one that is artificial with respect to the ancient Greeks. In other words, the ancient Greeks, such as Plato and Socrates, would have looked at that and said, you're doing it wrong. <laughs> they would have looked at us and said, no, that's, that's not right. You know, knowledge is actually good for you. And if you're trying to treat it as something separate, then you end up with all these other problems and, you know, difficulties. And I think Plato in particular would have smiled at this because for Plato, remember, Socrates may have been ironic in the pursuit of definitional knowledge. Definitional knowledge is exactly what we get in chapter zero of all of our biology textbooks, right? Where it says biology in boldface is the study of life and blah, blah, blah. And then all of these things, you know, are these definitions and you kind of have to encounter these facts and memorize things. And man, you know, if Socrates is right and this is precisely what doesn't work, this is precisely what we don't get out of the dialogues. We don't get definitions. We don't get a definition for life or virtue or justice, or we don't get anything that ultimately can be defended. And this is the case in, in grand style in something like the Republic. So the Republic proceeds on and tries to figure out what justice is. The very end of the Republic, book 10, is a myth. <laughs> it's literally Socrates telling the myth of air. And Scholars have looked at this and said, oh, that's really, is this even Plato? You know, I mean, Julianus said uh, that book 10 was an excrescence. In other words, something that was just kind of glommed on. I don't think that's right at all. A lot of Platonic scholars don't think that's right at all. But nevertheless, that's how different it is. And this is the end that Plato gives us in some cases is that, yeah, we're trying for knowledge. Yeah, we're trying for essences and we're trying to get there with the object of making us better people, but we don't get there we don't ever arrive at definition. So what is it that we're actually doing? What are the dialogues actually trying to do? And this is an open question, and it's one that we get hints of in the seventh letter. So in the seventh letter, Plato describes insight as like a spark. And that spark, you know, creates a fire, and the fire feeds on itself and becomes bigger and bigger. In other words, it's all metaphor. <laughs> he appeals to metaphor in this way and has us to think that, okay, well, maybe that's what the experience of philosophy is like through conversation. Maybe that's what the experience of insight is like. But does that result in definitions? Is that going to result in me being able to write a textbook on virtue? No, that's not what's going on. That's not what's happening at all. And so what I would say is that, I mean, Plato operated his own school, right? He operated the academy for a very long time in Athens. This was a prestigious thing. Aristotle was a student at the academy and was with Plato for 20 years. And so he was well known. He had plenty of time to write, plenty of time to do all of these things. If it was possible to result in particular bits of knowledge, surely that would have happened and there would have been some, you know, crib notes somewhere of this. There would have been some kind of encapsulation of here is what we found. This is what we were trying to get to. Even more so in thinking that geometry, mathematics, was a prerequisite. So famously, over the door at the academy, we are told that it said, none who have studied geometry shall enter here. So unless you've studied geometry, don't even bother trying to study philosophy. Philosophy was this thing that you did when you were older, like when you were, you know, had already studied all the other stuff. And that was still the case in the medieval system. And amusingly, <laughs> it used to be the case that we actually had freshman classes in philosophy, but oftentimes I'm seeing now with universities that they're pushing it to the sophomore level, at least. The thought is like, okay, you've got to have a grounding in something. Uh, and oftentimes people will say, oh, well, you've got to have an English composition class. Well, okay, yes, but it could still be a freshman class. Why are we making it a sophomore class? I think the implication is that we want to push this a little bit beyond, you know, age 17 and 18. We want to push this a little bit beyond 
uh, people who are just getting into the university for the first time and give them some kind of grounding and things before dropping them in and, and doing this kind of stuff. And the ancients, I think, would have laughed and said, you're doing it way too early. And Plato, certainly, you're doing it way too early. So, nevertheless, one of the things that Plato tells us, and Aristotle will say something very similar, is that the beginning of philosophy is in wonder. Philosophy begins with aporia. It begins in wonder. And that's poetic. It's interesting in a certain way. And it's a fun idea to, to contemplate. But at the same time, there is something significant there in the sense of curiosity and that there's something very practical about it, that philosophy cannot begin unless we have a sense of wonder. Unless we are curious about what's going on, then we're not going to be motivated to have any kind of motion to go learn things. We're not going to be motivated to apply conscious energy and actually learn anything. And Plato was at all times sensitive to this sort of thing, and that made his dialogue his dialogues, his dialectic, rather ministerial in a certain way, in that he was concerned about the motivations of his audience. He was concerned about the motivations of his interlocutors. Socrates had to be concerned about the motivations of his interlocutors because he didn't charge for his services. He wasn't a sophist. He wasn't an itinerant teacher that went around charging for their services, you know, making politicians essentially and making statesmen. The equivalent today is people who go and study law and political science and economics and that sort of thing in the university system. And so we teach people the art of rhetoric, and we teach people how to persuade. And that was very much alive in ancient Athens, and people looked somewhat, you know, suspiciously on this practice that they were teaching them to be politicians, because obviously politicians were regarded then in some ways uh, in the way that they are now, where there was some suspicion that you're only defending things to win. You're not trying to get to truth. You're just making the lesser argument stronger and being persuasive. And that's what Socrates was accused of. He was accused of being a sophist. He was accused of being one of these people who wasn't actually concerned with making people better. And in fact, of course, if you're only concerned with winning and persuasion and politics, then it may be just the opposite. It may be that you're actually trying to make people worse so that you can have a particular statesman or politician just achieve their selfish goals through rhetoric and persuasion. And so Socrates was confused with these people by a lot of those who didn't have very much you know, experience with him, but even some of those who did have experience with him, which is what we get in the Mino with Anitis. So Anitis is a, it, a piece of dark foreshadowing in the Mino, because Anitis is going to be one of the people who was at Socrates' trial. And Anitis did not have the best opinion of Socrates, and did think that he was engaged in sophistry, did think that he was corrupting the youth of Athens by talking to them about these things. And so there's a risk at all times for Socrates of being taken for a sophist. And so he has to be very careful not only to maintain motivation for people to continue in conversation with him, but also to avoid being caught up in, you know, corrupting the youth and these charges of impiety and these, you know, terrible slanderous things. And so he had to be worried about motivation in a way that oftentimes we don't. Uh, and I say we in the royal we of those who are writing in philosophy and religion and academia today, oftentimes, unfortunately, we are caught up in thinking that, well, okay, if someone doesn't read my book, if someone doesn't make it all the way through my arguments and they can't figure it out, well, that's kind of on them. You know, you've got to have more motivation and just kind of stick it out and slog through it. This is the organic chemistry thing again, you know, slog through it and, you know, get through it and you'll be a better person on the other side because you will have learned something and built up, I don't know, whatever, <laughs> Not this way in philosophy. Wasn't this way for Socrates and Plato. Was not, has not been this way in the ministerial traditions because any case where you have a voluntary participation in conversation, people can just get up and leave. If they're sufficiently bored or unhappy with what's going on, they can get up and leave. And that's the kind of thing that Anitis did to, you know, with tragic consequences. <laughs> Plato always had to be worried about this. This is another element of dialogues that's very interesting. You have to keep up that momentum. You have to keep up that motivation throughout the dialogue to try and, you know, get somewhere, to try and make progress with the interlocutor. And so that, I think, is very interesting. Along these same lines, Plato also said, knowledge which is acquired under compulsion has no grip on the mind. And so if it's acquired under compulsion, in other words, if it's not voluntary— if we're not voluntarily engaging in philosophic conversation, it's not going to have a grip on the mind in the sense, of course, that we won't remember it, but also that we won't internalize it. We won't internalize it in terms of creating that network of associations, which is so catalytic and foundational for insight and growth 
growth specifically in becoming a better person. And so, in other words, philosophy does not accomplish and cannot accomplish its aims unless we are willing participants that have sustained motivation and that motivation provides the energy that makes it possible for us to change. In other words, it, may, it creates the fire, it creates the heat that makes it possible for us to remold the kind of people that we are and for us to grow as people through philosophical conversation. That was the model for ancient Greek philosophy, was to grow and become a better person through philosophical conversation by the heat of that conversation in terms of motivation and energy to understand. Now, that being said, let's wrap this up by talking about the three metaphors that are associated with Socrates. Those are the gadfly, the physician of the soul, and the philosophic midwife. So, the gadfly, I think, is the easy one, in the sense that a gadfly, and we still use the word gadfly, I kind of wish we didn't because nobody actually says gadfly, it's the horsefly, it's just a big fly. And flies are a a good metaphor here because it's not a stinging insect. It doesn't actually hurt the horse. It's just really irritating. (laughs) And you can't seem to get rid of it. So even if you you flip your tail metaphorically at it to try and get rid of the, the, the gadflies, the horse flies, you can't really get rid of them. If they want to keep circling around you, they're going to keep circling around you. There's not a whole lot you can do about it, and it's very irritating. That's the way that Socrates was understood, was that he was a gadfly that just wouldn't go away. That irritation was persistent. And persistent irritation, this is the key here, is that it, it is experienced as irritating precisely because there is opportunity for growth. In other words, the irritation is the unpleasantness that is associated with learning something new. If we're in an echo chamber, which is oftentimes the way that people talk about you know, social media and, and the dialogues that happen online and with news outlets today, is that if we're in an echo chamber where we're only listening to people who think like we do, then we are depriving ourselves of the opportunity of actually being able to grow by encountering other perspectives. Socrates was a gadfly insofar as he constantly provided another perspective. He always provided an irritation, which was specifically another perspective, another way of seeing things, and questioning, which pushed us to go beyond the boundaries of our current perspective and our current way of seeing things. So there's some depth to that. It's not just, yeah, he was irritating, you know, because he wouldn't leave you alone. It's that he wouldn't leave you alone and he wouldn't let you be comfortable. It's specifically comfortable. We are comfortable when we're listening to people who are talking and thinking like we do. We become uncomfortable insofar as they push us to go outside of the bounds of what we normally and habitually think and feel. And that's the key, is habitually think and feel. So we have patterns of thought and uh, emotion that we regularly run through. And these patterns can be long strings of emotion where, you know, I like seeing something, let's say, maybe that I know that I can object to on intellectual grounds so that I can feel indignant, so that I can then feel like I should change things, so that I can then buy, um, you know, uh, recycled paper towels and feel like I did something or, you know, whatever, whatever it is. And we like going through a chain of events and feelings, thoughts and feelings that are very comfortable and familiar to us. And this, of course, could be said on on either side, right? I mean, that example was chosen kind of at random. When people make us uncomfortable in conversation like that, they are doing so, or at least one of the ways of doing so, is by giving us some material to think about that is not as easily digested. And that's precisely what's going on with Socrates and what's going on with the metaphor of the gadfly. Now, the um, physician of the soul. So, Socrates is a physician of the soul, and we hear medical terminology being used with respect to philosophy in the same way here with Plato and Socrates as we do with Buddhism. And so in Buddhism, we hear a lot of medical terminology in terms of, you know, what is the sickness of the soul? What's wrong with the soul? What would what can we do? How do we approach this sickness as a doctor might approach a sickness to try and prescribe a treatment, in other words, a course of action that will help us to get out of that and go beyond it? And that's precisely the kind of thing that Plato is attempting to do, that Socrates is attempting to do, and I'm not trying to distinguish between the two, um, with dialectic and with the dialogues. So, the physician of the soul is specifically someone who makes the soul better, and that is through knowledge. So, Socrates makes the soul better by trying to get rid of ignorance. Trying to get rid of ignorance is actually good for you, and so Socrates is a physician of the soul. All right, now, Perhaps the most interesting and the last of these metaphors is the philosophical midwife. So, a philosophical midwife, a midwife is someone who assists in birth, but doesn't actually give birth. So, the midwife is someone who is there to help someone else give birth. And 
this is particularly revealing because this tells us a lot about what's going on in the dialogues and what's happening with dialectic. That the purpose of Socratic conversation is for you to give birth to your own insights, for you to give birth to your own philosophical ideas, and for you to have that process of conception of something that is truly new, truly transformative, and life-changing. And that's the idea, and that's Socrates' role. Well, here's the thing. If that's Socrates' role, and that's the real purpose of everything that he says, then what that means is that the entirety of the Platonic corpus is hortatory, in other words, it is rhetorical in, an, in the sense that the only thing that counts is whether or not you grow as an individual. The, the words, the claims, what's actually said, none of that really matters except insofar as they serve as tools to help you grow. So that's what it means for something to be hortatory, that it is rhetorical and trying to get you to you know, inspire you to action that will be productive for you. So if that's really what matters— if the growth of the person who is encountering the philosophical conversation, and specifically with Plato, encountering his teaching within the academy, and now for us as readers encountering it in the dialogues, if that's what's important, then none of the individual words actually matter. So none of the claims, none of the individual events, people, personalities, all of those pieces are just tools. All of those pieces are tools in the service of helping you to grow and to give birth to your own philosophical insights. Now, that's not to say that anything goes. It's not to say that there aren't ways of getting it wrong. But what it is saying is that all of these interpretive challenges, you know, is it Plato? Is it Socrates? Why doesn't he get to truth? What's the real nature of what's going on with the oracle and how it is that he was trying to prove the oracle wrong? How should we understand Socrates in relation to religion and the poets and justice and all these other things? All these individual questions that we can ask, those are good. They're very fruitful for us to ask. But for Plato and Socrates, it may be the case, insofar as he is a philosophical midwife, that he is encouraging us to look into these things not to get at knowledge specifically, not to get at like bold-faced glossary term knowledge that we're going to write in a textbook, but to have knowledge in the sense of personal transformation, insight. That's perhaps the real goal. And so this makes Plato simultaneously very familiar, very challenging, but also very interesting and rewarding.